Shake yourself from the dust, arise, O captive Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, You were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, My people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrians oppressed them for nothing. Now, therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? Their rulers wail, says the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. That was Isaiah 52, a passage that Ignacio Eucaria heard God speaking to an oppressed Latin America aspiring for liberation. And this is the Liberation Theology Podcast, a close look at the basic concepts of Latin American liberation theology. I'm your host, David Inchauskas. Welcome, welcome back. On this episode, we hear once more from Ignacio Ea Correa, the Jesuit philosopher, theologian, and president of the Central American University, who was assassinated on November 16, 1989, for his firm commitment to the oppressed peoples of El Salvador during the country's long and bloody civil war. Not too long before his murder, Ignacio Eucaria wrote the essay we'll be discussing today, Utopia and Prophecy. These two concepts are critical points of light in the constellation of the liberationist theory, so I'm eager to share them with you today. But it's also a special episode in the sense that we'll be hearing in the second half from my fellow Jesuit in formation, Dr. Patrick St. John, about his new book, The Spiritual Work of Racial Justice, especially as it relates to Ignatian spirituality and liberation theology. Patrick has been actively involved in a group called JARS, the Jesuit Anti-Racism Sodality. He's been a young leader within the Jesuits and within the church, animating the work of racial reconciliation. And I'm sure that y'all will enjoy our conversation, so please stick around for it. Additionally, I'll share some brief thoughts on language, form, and the mass per a question from a listener about the recent discussion following Pope Francis's letter, Tradiciones Custodes. Right now, though, let's break open this riveting chapter of Mysterium Liberationis and jump into the content for today. The Marxist tradition is known for its critique of utopianism, and here, well, we have an essay about utopia. One of Engels' most widely read works is Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. In it, Engels critiques idealist trends in socioeconomic praxis and doubles down on historical materialism. Likewise, Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto critique clerical socialism with their celebrated line, quote, Christian socialism is but the holy water with which the priest consecrates the heart burnings of the aristocrat, end quote. A little ouch, but to be honest, you have to admire their banger tweet uh, writing style. It's very engaging. But Eucharia is aware of this critique, and the Latin American liberation theologians seek to respond to it. That's why, in my opinion, Eucharia begins his essay the way he does. He writes that utopia and prophecy do not contribute to, but rather help avoid idealist escapism, and that the Bible, far from a fairy tale, is a historical place-based document, not an escapist one. And we'll see this thread appear throughout the essay, Ea Korea responding to these critiques of uh, Marxists, especially atheist Marxists uh, like Marx and Engels. 
When liberation theologians speak of utopia, they are not adopting a perspective that there is a firm distinction between heaven and earth, history and eternity, flesh and spirit, and that Christianity is an option for the latter in each of those dichotomies. Rather, as Air Korea writes, quote, Christian eternity is inexorably linked to temporality since the word became history, end quote. And here we hear echoes of Air Korea's essay that we covered in episodes 9 and 10 on the historicity of Christian salvation. Christianity is not so much about people pursuing a utopia in another world so much as God, a uh, spirit taking on flesh and journeying with humanity within our history, uh, very much so a historical religion and something that continues in the practice of Jesus Christ and in liberation theology, which sees itself as working for justice in the present moment. There's no need for these things to be opposed. In Christianity, they come very much so together, heaven and earth, history and eternity, flesh and spirit. Put succinctly, Ea Korea's position on utopia and prophecy, the topic of this essay, is that in liberation praxis, prophecy is the method, utopia is the horizon, and Christ's reign is the revelation. Let's uh, break that down a little bit. Prophecy denounces injustice, announces justice, and takes concrete steps to move from injustice to justice. That's more or less the definition that we can glean from Gustavo Gutierrez's A Theology of Liberation. That's what a prophet is. That's what a prophet does. Denounce, announce, and then take concrete steps to move from injustice to justice. Utopia provides visions of justice in terms of a horizon towards which society aims. So the question becomes, well, where do we get these visions of justice in a very much so unjust world. That is where we turn to the horizon of utopia, towards the hopes and dreams, the aspirations of humanity for a good society, but at the same time a society that very much so does not exist yet. These visions of utopia, utopia is kind of a general, indiscreet term. So where do they come from? Well, in the Christian tradition, they come through revelation, especially the biblical revelation of the reign of God. Prophecy is the action, utopia is the goal, and the reign of God illustrates that goal. I find it curious that Pope Francis adopts Ea Korea's language here about utopia in his early apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. This is something that called my attention when I was writing my undergraduate thesis on liberation theology, especially the dialogue between the Vatican and liberation theologians. I noticed this shift that was happening as, of course, right as I was in undergrad, that's when Pope Francis uh, became the Pope. And I, of course, read very enthusiastically Evangelii Angelii Gaudium. And in paragraph uh, 222, Pope Francis writes, quote, People live poised between each individual moment and the greater, brighter horizon of the utopian future as the final cause which draws us to itself, end quote. There is a positive use of the verbiage of utopia by Francis, and that's a departure from the more negative use of Francis's predecessors, Benedict and John Paul II. For instance, in Caritas and Veritate, paragraph 53, Pope Emeritus Benedict writes, quote, All of humanity is alienated when too much trust is placed in merely human projects, ideologies, and false utopias. And that's the case throughout the writings of Benedict and John Paul II. In general, utopia is used in a derogatory sense as a human project that is really without inspiration from God and that can lead to nowhere because we have a, a fallen, sinful humanity. I don't want to say there's a causal link between Pope Francis's utopian language and the liberation theologians, but it is illuminating that there is a correlation there. And Pope Francis, like the liberation theologians, does use utopia in a positive sense. That's a bit of a fun contemporary aside, but getting back to the text, Ea Korea follows his introduction of utopia and prophecy with his first section entitled, Christian Utopia Can Only Be Constructed from Prophecy, and Christian Prophecy Should Keep in Mind the Necessity and the Characteristics of Christian Utopia. 
pretty long section heading. But by the way, I do like that Air Korea uses full sentences uh, as titles of the subdivisions of his chapter. Each heading is essentially a thesis statement, and that's great if you're trying to follow along for the sake of clarity. It's, uh, it's nice and easy to follow. I've mentioned the relationship between utopia and the reign of God briefly, uh, the reign of God illustrating uh, the dimensions of utopia, but Ea Korea goes into it in much more detail now. He writes, quote, The concretizing of utopia is that which historicizes the reign of God, both in human hearts and in structures, without which these hearts could not beat, end quote. Think of the New Testament. There are loads of passages in which Jesus speaks of the reign of God. The reign of God is at hand. It belongs to the poor. It's like a mustard seed, a wedding banquet, a vineyard. It's among us. It's inherited by those who satisfy the material needs of the poor, as in Matthew 25. And then the great line of Jesus uh, after the rich young man, quote, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the reign of God, end quote. These passages give us an idea of what are the dimensions of the reign of God. Uh, we hear reign of God, we're a little bit like, what is that? <laughs> and, and the New Testament really does fill that out, as it seems like almost every other passage in the New Testament is about what the reign of God is. And the reign of God, when we begin to understand those passages, it helps us to understand what utopia is. Utopia being kind of a general term for a good place, but one that doesn't exist in fullness at the present. And we know that line, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of humanity, what God has ready for those who love God. But, you know, it's a little hard to say exactly what that is if we've never imagined it and we've never seen it. But the reign of God does work to change that. It gives us a glimpse into utopia, and these glimpses reveal that it's, in short, and as liberation theologians like to put it, the paradise of the poor. It's a liberated society. This general universal utopia preached as the reign of God has already been announced and promised by the Hebrew prophets and by Jesus. So it's kind of already set, we could say, in a way. But at the same time, we must live it creatively in the present, as of course Jesus' conditions are not our conditions in society. There are similarities, there are also differences. And at the same time, we respect the fact as Christians that we have been given revelation, that revelation comes from God. So that revelation is going to speak to us, but also our present moment speaks to us. And that's where the creativity comes from the dynamism between what is given to us in prophecy by Jesus, by the Old Testament prophets, and what we see in the present. And so sometimes, as I like to put it, there is an Old Testament, there's a New Testament, and there's a Now Testament. Living utopia now is what prophecy is. Prophecy makes plain the gap between utopia and the current state of affairs, and then works to close it. Ea Korea writes the following definition of prophecy, quote, The critical contrasting of the enunciation of the fullness of the reign of God with a determinate historical situation, end quote. The determinate historical situation in Latin America is, as we covered in the first episode with Oliveros, it's one of immense suffering for the masses. And prophecy responds to the suffering, quite simply, by acting to end it, <laughs> ending the immense pain and ending the structural causes of this pain. And here we see examples. It's like the Black Panther Party with the breakfast program and also its political action. It's seeking to alleviate this immediate need of hunger, but then also get at the causes of this hunger, which are steeped in uh, racism and classism. And it's the Catholic Church. If we think of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church has soup kitchens, for example, that again are uh, homeless shelters meeting the needs of those uh, without housing who are seeking for housing, those without food and drink who are seeking for food and drink and clothing. But it's also in great in Catholic history, we have these great examples like the lay political organizations like Catholic Action for example, which is working on the structural, systemic, political causes of these phenomena of poverty that we are seeing. A liberating Christianity alleviates 
suffering, but not through indifference, nor through condoning a suffering present for the sake of a blissful, blissful future afterlife. A liberating Christianity alleviates suffering through struggle, through protest. And here, Ea Korea brings in another uh, renowned Marx quote, Religious suffering is, at one and the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. If that's the case, if religion is the sigh, this protest, this heart, this soul, then there's no reason why it has to be the also, the opiate of the people, as Marx uh, suggests in his next line. I'm not sure that we have to make that jump. Protest, almost by definition, <laughs> does not have to be an evasion. A protest is a confrontation. And though Christian utopia may not be fully achieved in history, I, and I don't think that really at the end of the day, I mean, who thinks? <laughs> you can take, you know, the most dogmatic uh, Marxist, you can take the uh, most dogmatic Christian. Do those folks really believe that in this world we're going to be able to alleviate every single moment of suffering? Many Marxists affirm, in fact, that as we make the transition from capitalism to socialism to communism, that uh, contradictions are going to continue. And even in a communist society, it's not as if uh, there's going to be no suffering. So the Christian utopia, Christians know, we, we know that it's not going to be fully achieved in history, but that doesn't mean that it can't be efficacious. If utopia, in fact, if utopia doesn't animate, then it's not Christian utopia. That's what Aeacharia says here. If utopia doesn't inspire historical action, then it's just not inspired by God at all, as God is active in all things and wants us to be active, collaborating with God's activity in all things in the present moment. That's where God is operating in the present moment. So we need to be operating there as well. So rather than an opiate, I see religion, that is good liberating religion, as a stimulant. It's more like coffee than codeine. It propels us forward. The spirit sends outward. It does not necessarily send outward upward. And here we can think of maybe the movement of Ascension and Pentecost. I, I like to really hit home on this point, right? Because Jesus ascends into heaven and the uh, disciples are looking up into the heaven and the angels are just like, stop looking up into heaven. Uh, you need to look more horizontally. Look at the work that you need to do. Now that Jesus is gone, the Holy Spirit is going to come and going to make you missionary disciples. So then, of course, Pentecost does come and uh, the Pentecost is is ascending forth of Jesus's disciples into the world. It's ascending outward. So God, relative hum to humanity, moves downward and outward. And that's kind of what humanity is called to do, to move in solidarity with the poor and to move outward in terms of organizing. So prophecy propels us outward horizontally along the plane of history. But in what direction is history trending? Towards the reign of God or the anti-reign? Towards plowshares or swords? Towards pruning hooks or spears? We have to check our social trajectory against the priorities and promises of Jesus. This is what Aeacharia calls the dialectic between the given and the historical. The given is the wisdom of the church, its Bible, its tradition. And this given is valuable because it's the truth of faith. The historical, then, is our social analysis of the present moment. It's valuable because it's the truth of reason. And I think here of the metaphor, which I think is a good one, from Fides et Ratio by John Paul II, that faith and reason are like two wings on a bird. And, you know, you just have one of those two wings and you're going to move around in circles. But the, the faith gives you that horizon, that, that utopic horizon towards which we are moving. Um, if we're only looking at the present and only looking at the past, then where is the hope? Where is the faith? Where is the propelling towards a future that we can't? cannot see because we don't 
know what the society that we are seeking. We don't know what it looks like. We, we only see what we have in the present. We only see what we have in the past. So that's where faith comes in handy. We need both faith and reason. We need a scientific analysis and a utopian one. In support of the unique role of Jesus Christ in history, uh, Ea Korea writes, and this is a curious line, we'll talk about it, discuss it a little bit here, quote, the Christian character of utopia cannot reach fulfillment but through Christian faith, explicitly accepted and lived, though we must acknowledge that the Spirit can use people who are not explicitly Christian and even those who are anti-Christian, end quote. So let me offer some commentary on this quote. It's a significant one. It's even a challenging one, especially for folks who hold a Marxist theory of socialism or those who don't hold Christianity in special esteem amongst the world religions. And I would say I do definitely do not have it all figured out on this point, at this point. And I don't think I can even give a convincing rational argument for the unique role of Christianity and liberation apart from one that stems from my Christian belief in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, fully God, fully human. What I can say, however, is that I see value in utopian thinking as understood by Ea Correa Gutierrez and other liberation theologians. And I see its value beyond a strict Marxist atheist position. Why? Well, call me an Aristotelian, uh, but I think we need to have at least some notion of the final cause, the goal to which we are moving in order to take historical actions towards it. How can we move towards a communist society if we have no data about what it will be like? We can't. It's just not possible. We need to have faith, and this faith must have some content. And here there's lots of debates about, you know, what is Marxist faith? What does it look like? Uh, hard to say, hard to say, given the historical materialism. But for me, this context comes from my Christian convictions, from Jesus's revelation about the reign of God. In liberationist terms, prophetic action needs utopia in order to have direction. As such, prophetic action without utopia is actually more of an empty promise than prophetic action with utopia, for at least ut the utopic prophet has a vision of something. That said, I'm I I don't I don't know fully. I, I haven't worked this out. I need to continue thinking about it, and I'm eager to continue hearing what other folks have to say about utopia, Christianity, materialism, dialectical and historical Marxism, and the like. And these comments are just initial sketches um, that I have found helpful for my own integration of Christianity and liberation. But please do chime in. I, I love to hear what are your own understandings of all of this via social media and the Liberation Theology Podcast email. I love to dialogue with you. Uh, is is it? Korea right to speak of the Christian character of utopia, which can only be achieved through an explicit Christian faith. And I know that different liberation theologians have different understandings of this. I've spoken in the past of my liking for uh, Juan Luis Segundo, who has a little bit of a different answer to this question, which we may talk about down the road. But let me be clear either way. I, like Air Korea, think that all people of goodwill, atheists, agnostics, believers of different religions, non-Catholic Christians, and Catholics of different theologies and spiritualities as, you know, we say Catholic, but there's so many different uh, understandings uh, that Catholics have. All people of goodwill can and do make integral contributions to the process of liberation of the oppressed. So I hope that no one feels excluded by my comments here. I'm, I'm just for now calling calling it like I see it from my commitments as a Catholic and a liberationist, and I'm open to changing my mind about the way that some of these things fall together. Ea Korea's next section is entitled, quote, Latin America is currently a privileged space for prophecy and utopia, though the actualization of its prophetic and utopic potential is still far from satisfactory, end quote. Another uh, long but illuminating title. Latin America is a continent with attributes similar to the suffering servant of the prophet Isaiah. It's a shoot emerging from a dry land, metaphorically. A uh, place of pain, but also a place of redemption, a silent lamb that also 
is increasingly roaring like a lion. It's been abused from the time of the armed conquest of the Christian Spaniards. It's also brimming with active conscious protest. Its soil carries the blood of its recent martyrs. Its air carries the cries of its recent prophets. Latin America is witness to incessant revolutionary political and Christian movements. In this crucible of a continent, the poor church and poor society might just find a winning medicine for liberation, and in some cases already have. Something that tips Latin America towards revolutionary praxis is the undesirability of current conditions. Quote, an unjust and predatory distribution of its resources as a whole, and even of the resources of each nation in favor of the few. End quote. Different from the United States, where few people see the fundamental error of our capitalist system, though that is increasingly changing, I think. In Latin America, many people have a deeply critical consciousness, in part because the suffering is so great, and those who experience the suffering know the nature of the problem the best. Where socialism in the United States is a minority position, to say the least, socialism has won state power in numerous times throughout Latin American history. This critical, prophetic, revolutionary element in Latin America recognizes that though it wants liberty and justice for all, it does not want liberty and justice in the U.S. or European way. It wants it in its own way, in a Latin American way. Air Korea writes, quote, The prophetic and utopic Latin America is not looking to imitate those who are currently the highest and furthest ahead. The developed world is in no way the desired utopia, including its way of overcoming poverty and much less its injustice, but rather a warning of what not to be and what not to do, end quote. So you want to look at what not to do, look at the U.S. and Europe. That's Korea's position here. This Latin American vanguard position, it sees that the wealth of the global north is built on the sweat, blood, and tears of the global south. And it will not replicate this system, but resist it. Liberation happens not when the poor become rich on the terms of the rich, but when the poor become free for the common good as they define it. Latin American culture thrives not when it adapts to the dominant norms of the U.S. culture, but when it charts its own path. And so too in the church. Ea Korea says, quote, The preferential option for the poor, the poor taking the initiative, can radically transform the church and can so become the key and and motor of Christian utopia as a liberating historical project, end quote. Yet we have to be honest about the church's current way of proceeding, which is far from this liberationist way of proceeding. We have to acknowledge that the church is fallible, though not in dogma of faith and morals, but certainly in the evil of its members and especially its leaders. On this matter, Ea Korea has some harsh but truthful words. Quote, as scandalous as it may be in a situation like Latin America's subcontinent in which injustice and faith cohabit, most Christians, including religious priests, bishops, cardinals, and nuncios, not only lack the prophetic charism, but contradict it, and even constitute an anti-sign as persecutors of prophecy and proponents of the structures and forces of domination. As long as these don't jeopardize their institutionalized ecclesiastical privileges and advantages. Towards the preferential option for the poor, the hierarchy gives some verbal respect, but little effective practice. End quote. There is a name for this phenomenon, hypocrisy. It's the same hypocrisy that Jesus criticizes in the religious leaders of his day, scribes and Pharisees. It's saying one thing and doing another. The Medellin and Puebla bishops' documents were and are, I read them today, they are revolutionary, but they had little real effect, Ea Korea says, on church structure and behavior. The Latin American church has been and continues to be too tolerant of injustice. Yes, there are examples of noble Christian prophets throughout Latin American history, from Bartolomé de las Casas to Oscar Romero, but they are much more of an exception than a norm. 
All too often, the church takes the preferential option for power instead of the preferential option for the poor. It contents itself with the mainstream European North American model, preaching mercy more than justice, cozying up with political and economic power, never risking suffering and sacrifice for the sake of the common good, let alone for the good of those at the margins of society. The church, if it is so, becomes an ideological weapon of the capitalist state. It loses its prophetic edge, it loses what should be at its core, its imitation of Jesus Christ, executed for his prophetic stand. Nevertheless, we must admit, and this gives me confidence, there is a faithful remnant that has survived the Constantinian era, which in some ways continues in the present, when empire co-opted Christianity. And as prophesied in 2 Kings 19, quote, the survivors that are left of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will go a remnant and survivors out of Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. End quote. This remnant is made up of prophets who hold the torch of utopia and struggle to preserve and extend its flame. It's a torch of solidarity, not competition, of the poor masses, not the elite few. <music> Ea Korea's third section makes the claim that, quote, Utopic prophecy points to a new form of freedom in humanity through a historical process of liberation, end quote. To show one of the Catholic Church's approaches to the insufficiency of old forms, Ea Korea quotes paragraph 22 of John Paul II's Solicitudo Re Socialis. Quote, each of the two blocks, Eastern and Western, harbors in its own way a tendency towards imperialism, as it is usually called, or towards forms of neocolonialism, an easy temptation to which they frequently succumb, as history, including recent history, teaches, end quote. And curious here, I, it is the case that, in my opinion, Pope St. John Paul II was an opponent of certain trends in liberation theology, and that is shown through some of his actions. But in other ways, John Paul II's thinking was very much so consonant with liberation theology. John Paul II, even to the Brazilian bishops, said that uh, liberation theology was good and expedient. But here we see, you know, sometimes people have, again, stereotypes. John Paul II, some could never imagine him speaking about imperialism, let alone neocolonialism, and yet here he does. But regarding the content of his quote here, I won't venture into the leftist debates about accusations of imperialism against Russia and China, what Marxist-Leninists say, what Marxist-Leninist-Maoists say, the different positions that are held. But I will cite Ea Korea who a few lines later suggests that misguidedly, quote, the church continues to fear the evils of Soviet imperialism more than U.S. imperialism. The church then tolerates the real evils of the U.S. and criticizes the potential evils of the USSR. End quote. Ea Korea was clear on his position. There are issues with U.S. capitalism and there are issues with Soviet communism. However, given that the current evils in Latin America are more capitalist than communist, he's prone to criticize capitalism more. Again, liberation theology deals with reality, and so we have to address the reality of the damage in capitalism, which is greater in Latin America than the damage of communism. He then proceeds to do just this criticism with a robust list of imperialist capitalist ills, external debt, the exploitation of prime materials, trash dumping, military operations, private accumulation, and consumerism enabled by propagandistic advertising. Ea Korea denounces, quote, the intrinsic evil of the capitalist system and the ideological lie of the appearance of democracy, which accompanies, legitimizes, and disguises it, end quote. He speaks of the evil capitalist principle of the hombre lobo, or wolfman, selling to the other at the highest price possible and buying at the lowest price possible. 
The whole system is built on seeking to screw the other person for one's private gain. But why Aokuria's critique of the facade of democracy in capitalist society? Well, because he has seen time and time again that the United States of America's perceived sense of national security is more important than the actual self-determination of other nations. Guatemala takes a turn to the left. The U.S. sees a threat and works for regime change. Cuba turns communist. The U.S. sees a threat and works for regime change. Chile turns communist. The U.S sees a threat and works for regime change. Nicaragua goes Sandinista and the U.S. sees threat and works for regime change. There is a clear pattern. Revolution, perceived threat to U.S. interests, then U.S. action towards a more favorable option on its own terms. U.S. democracy is premised on anti-democracy around the world. When it comes down to it, the U.S. does not actually trust in democracy around the world. It does not trust in the self-determination of other countries. It trusts in its money and in its military. Apart from this critique of U.S. capitalism and the pseudo-democracy that accompanies it, Air Korea offers another critique with a surprisingly Kantian spin. Quote, The offer of humanization and freedom that the rich countries make to poor countries is not universalizable and so is not human. There are not enough material resources on earth for all countries to achieve the same level of production and consumption as the rich countries currently do. End quote. The expansion of capitalist wealth through throughout the world would make the planet a steamy trash heap. And while it's already doing it, we overheat. Our oceans turn to plastic wastelands, mining levels, mountains, and garbage piles up in our valleys. No, uh, U.S. consumption is not the way. The way is Jesus. The way is the protagonism of the poor. Ea Korea asserts that in the poor resides the real presence of Jesus. Jesus poor. Jesus poor. And therefore the greatest capacity for liberation, which the Beatitudes and final judgment passages make clear, clearer in fact than many other things that are dogmatically defined with much less biblical basis. We look at Matthew 5 and 25. We read the doctrines of the kingdom of the poor and of God's real presence in the poor. These doctrines are just as clear as the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and other parts of the Bible. This is my body. This is my my blood, the kingdom of God belongs to the poor. I mean, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God, right? These doctrines are, are clear and, and much clearer, in fact, than other doctrines, like the doctrine in the Catholic Church we have of papal infallibility or Mary's perpetual virginity. I'm not saying that these doctrines are not true. I'm just saying that the fact is that they don't have as much of a biblical basis as do the doctrines of liberation theology, for example, the reign of the poor and God's real presence in the poor. But liberation does not come from the poor full stop. We have to acknowledge that prophets emerge most prevalently in the poor with spirit, that is, the active, organized poor. Yes, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, but now that you're with them, listen to them. Carry out social analysis with them. Do the work of conscientization together. Organize together. Tap into their hope. Hope is a powerful thing and a powerfully Christian thing. It may seem that the struggle is worthless. It may seem that the struggle is long, but we bet on hope. We hope against hope. We act on hope. And there's no more illustrative example of this than Exodus, right? There, what are the chances that the Hebrew slaves make it out of that situation? Uh, and yet they hope, they doubt, and th yet they continue to hope. So when we have hope, and our hope propels us to action, we find that our lives, otherwise existentially bankrupt, begin to teem with meaning. Quote, Faced with the emptiness of the senselessness of life, which seeks to be filled with activities and pretensions without any deep meaning, the poor with spirit in Latin America are a real operative sign that there are many meaningful tasks in this world. End quote. But what are we hoping for? What gives this sense to our sentience? Happiness. And Air Korea here is not talking about the hee hee ha ha. He's not talking about being entertained. He's talking about joy. He's not talking about being busy, filling your day with activities that pass the time. 
He's talking about being fulfilled. He's not talking about partying. He's talking about celebrating the life of the people. And religion is about celebration. In Catholics, we certainly know this. We have feast days left and right. Seems like every day of the calendar is a feast day. And, you know, we have these ordinary uh, times, which I know it's about the numbers, but really the, every day is kind of extraordinary as we have all of these examples of, of saints whose lives are just totally extraordinary. And the poor masses in Catholic countries, they love feast days. Latin America lives and breathes popular piety. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Carmen, Aparecida, uh, St. Anthony, St. Francis, the angels and the saints. Each village has a patron saint and celebrates with a festival. The parishes have patron saints and celebrate with a festival. The fact is that if we're honest, a lot of the masses in Latin America are animated by a Christian spirit, oftentimes more so than by a political one. And many of our African and Middle Eastern comrades are animated by a Muslim spirit. And that's another reason why I think that our communist sisters and brothers should have an openness to to religion. Religion is frequently ro woven deeply into the fabric of struggle. And there's no reason why this religion cannot be woven in turn into the tapestry of liberation. As Aea says, religion can be a protest. Well, and <laughs> that's what Marx said. It can be the heart of a heartless capitalist world. And the heart pumps blood to the body. It animates, it refreshes, it gets people moving. And no, we certainly don't want this religious spirit to evaporate into inactive subjectivities. Religion should lead to struggle if it is true religion. But let's face it, for tons of folks, as Air Korea writes, politicizing is neither first nor fundamental. Religion is often first. It's a way in, and we should respect that. We should listen to the wisdom of religion, the religious wisdom of the people. We should also challenge it when it's becoming just another ideological apparatus of the capitalist state, as often happens. But when I think of the unity of Jesus and the poor, of the church and the community, of prophecy and progress, of religion and revolution, of Christianity truly married to struggle, it does fill me with hope. It makes me want to celebrate. I I'm reminded of the beautiful slogan, of Francisco Morazán, the founder of the United Central American State. Dios, Unión, Libertad. God, Unity, Freedom. Religion does not have to be an instrument of empire. It can be integrated into the revolutionary process and often is. But to do so, we have to carry out what Air Korea calls a new revolution. We must commit to a fresh beginning, listening to the words of the prophet Isaiah. Quote, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. End quote. And then there are the words of Christ in the book of Revelation. Quote, Behold, I am making all things new. End quote. That's why I've called for a total restructuring of church and society, and that's why liberation theologians of many stripes have done the same. And no, I, we, we're not suggesting a complete disregard for tradition, for dogma. Absolutely not. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a pope either, or we shouldn't have bishops or priests or deacons. As Ea Korea writes, liberation theology speaks of, quote, beginning anew, but not from zero, end quote. Beginning anew means an evangelical reorientation, a ressourcement, a return to the original sources, to the Bible. And in the Bible, what we find is the God of life. God breathes life into creation at the dawn of history. God breathes life into the enslaved Hebrew people in Egypt. God breathes life into death itself in the resurrection of Christ. God is madly in love with humanity, madly in love with our life. God wants us to live and to have life to the full, life in abundance. That's why life must be at the center of ecclesial and societal reorganization. Air Korea comments on, quote, the enormous necessity and non-interchangeability of material life in the first place as a fundamental primary gift on which all others must be rooted as a development upon it, end quote. Liberation theologians hold that not all rights and freedoms are equal. The right to life comes first. It's the most fundamental. Without it, all other rights and freedoms are meaningless. Food, water, housing, and health care are structurally essential to the actualization of this right. So we must call out the nonsense of the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights and its interpreters 
unfortunately, like Amnesty International, which does great work, but I think on this point gets it wrong, which claims that, quote, all human rights are equally important, end quote. I'm sorry, but I think the right to marry, the right to migration, the right to free speech, these are not as important as the right to life. A living is, itself is more important, more foundational than the right to marry, to move, and to say and do what you want. Life comes first. As such, Korea affirms, quote, it's not primarily liberty that engenders liberation, but rather liberation that engenders liberty, end quote. And here's the connection. When securing civil liberties trumps economic necessities, the rich are the ones whose rights get to be exercised. They have the wealth to be able to express their rights. Like we said last episode, the poor may have rights, in some ethereal realm, but if they don't have the resources to live these rights, then they mean very little. So in the order of operations, revolution comes before rights. Ea Korea reminds us that the famous liberties of the Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights are concrete achievements obtained by struggle. And even these, these too, these too suffer from the negative consequences of a largely white bourgeois struggle. The fullness of rights will come in the wake of a proletarian revolution that forms a universal bedrock securing primarily life and secondarily civil liberties for all. Liberation. Liberation begins with these basic necessities and then it builds the positive conditions for the ever more mature exercise of freedom and the reasonable enjoyment of our shared freedoms. And that's a good note on which to conclude this portion of the podcast on the content of Air Korea's Utopia and Prophecy. It's a return to the wisdom I received from Padre Melo, the Honduran priest, uh, Jesuit, and liberationist. When looking at any social phenomenon, he says that we must ask who benefits. In this case, we can ask who benefits from the blanket claims that all rights are equal, the right to private property as much as the right to life. Well, those who already have a lot of private property are going to benefit from that conception. Only a revolutionary environment will shake up this supposed equality of rights and rightly put life, especially the life of the oppressed, at the center. Now for some comments on Pope Francis and the recent document on Latin Mass per a question from a listener. In general, I don't have a strong reaction to this document from Pope Francis. I do have a number of friends who go to the traditional Latin Mass and find that to be a very meaningful expression of their Christianity. There are many folks on the Christian left who have a liturgical preference for the traditional Latin Mass. I have found that in times of my life, I have enjoyed the traditional Latin Mass, especially as I was uh, coming back to my own Catholicism in England. But my liturgical ideas have evolved over time as to what I think is the best way liturgically to express the mystery of the Christian tradition, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we know that I've spoken about uh, liturgy being ugly. And what I mean by that is that the liturgy is a sacrifice, and it's a commemoration, again, of this passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if the liturgy, through its external beauty and the bells and whistles, is not taking us to that fundamental reality of the meaning of the Mass, then we've lost something. So what I find is that simple, prophetic liturgies are the ones that I find the most powerful. These liturgies may not happen in the most grandiose, beautiful churches that you'll find in in parts of Europe and Asia and Latin America, the United States. There are beautiful churches. But I have found, especially in coming to liberation theology, that the masses that I have found the most powerful have been simple masses in simple environments, accompanying folks who often do not have sufficient economic resources to build these immense, beautiful, ornate chapels, but have a will, an immense will, to show up and be in community with each other and be inspired by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, 
I do think sometimes there can be a blockade when we are expressing those truths, one, in a language that we may not understand, Latin, in a way that is not promoting great participation of the masses who are present at the Mass. I prefer these simple, engaging liturgies that take us back to the fundamental fact that Jesus Christ was assassinated for standing for the poor and that God believed in the mission of the proclamation of the reign of God so much so that God lifted up Jesus from the dead, sent the Holy Spirit to the apostles so that they would then share this mission of the reign of God with the world. If the Mass isn't getting me to that reality, then I don't find it very helpful. Our special guest for this episode is Patrick St. John, PsyD from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, the UNAM, a wonderful institution, fellow member of the Society of Jesus, a man in formation, a regent like myself who works in university life but at Creighton University, and the recent author of this incredible new book that I would highly recommend folks get the spiritual work of racial justice. So I'm happy to share part of this conversation with Patrick St. John today, and we will discuss the way that his book relates to Ignatian spirituality. Here uh, we are approaching the feast day of St. Ignatius of Loyola, July 31st. And in this Ignatian year, the year when we are celebrating 500 years since the conversion of St. Ignatius of Loyola. So we'll talk Jesuit spirituality, we'll talk liberation theology, we'll talk his personal experiences, we'll talk also about his book, The Work of uh, Spiritual Work of Racial Justice. So enjoy this conversation with Patrick St. John. How can Ignatian spirituality provide a framework for us to do the spiritual work we need to do to address racial oppression? These concepts we've been speaking about, detachment, freedom, project, different Ignatian practices, how does your book connect those things to the structural issues of racial oppression in the United States? In 1962, James Baldwin on the essay that he published in New York Times was very, very clear, said like, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. This is where Ignatian spirituality also is talking to us today. Because number one is where he's calling us to come and then see, ask God, pray for the freedom that I just explained earlier, so that we can convert into ourselves to see the sin of division that's separating us. Ignatian spirituality, again, is all about experience, it's all about the conversion, especially this year, is a time for conversions. That's where it comes to play. And the concept of discernment, it's very, very important in Ignatian spirituality. We have done many, many things. We've been about like 400 years since we've been a struggle in this country. We walk many, many paths, especially the experience of the 60 years. We have seen many, many people killed. And recently here again, in our country, the, the experience of like in 2013-14, 2019 in Diallo, and then again here recently again, and like with George Floyd. David, I think we need to come and engage in this time of like discernment. What is God in the midst of all of this? What is God is telling me? And Ignatian spirituality is not about reactions, number one, but it's about actions. It's okay. In fact, this is why it's important. Like, why it's about action is called us like to find God's contemplations and actions. We have to go to the protest. We go to the protest. We go in into for actions. But what is the spiritual lens through which we engage in those actions? This is where it's important. What had happened in the sixties? We did not learn too so much. What did really happen like last year? Then here right now today, we have seen many, many people who have been talking, 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 writing in it, everything. But where is like the spiritual aspect of it? This is where Ignatian spirituality is coming handy. 
with everything is redirected, is redirecting us, sorry, to God. God has to be the one who come and help us with this. If this movement doesn't have the spiritual side into it, I don't know, my friend. I don't know where we're going to end up. I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced with the spiritual lens. If you want to reconstruct James Baldwin quote, who am I? I don't know, but I'm just trying to, to make it here. But anyway. And Patrick, what you just said really makes me think of the Exodus event. Because in the Exodus event, what we see is a liberation from oppression in the sense of the Hebrew people were enslaved and then were set free. Those who had no land of their own are given a land. But apart from that material aspect, what we also see is is one of the main reasons why God is keen on collaborating with Moses and the Hebrew people for their liberation is precisely for the worship of God, right? It's the idea that they would cross the Red Sea and they would be free to worship God. Mm -hmm. And, And so you see in that Exodus event, there is a unity between the material and the spiritual, which are dialectically related to each other. So while there is a progressive freedom that the Hebrew people are acquiring through this material liberation, they are also coming to a greater freedom in their spiritual lives, so much so that the greatest, I mean, in my opinion, one of the greatest spiritual breakthroughs in human history happens right after the Exodus event, which is the giving of the Ten Commandments. Yes, yes. This is exactly where we are today, David. The questions is that, are we willing? Are we open? What are we praying for? Are we going to let this opportunity happen, go without being open and spiritually open to receive the Ten Commandments that's supposed to come to us to renew our life and have this experience again, just like the Exodus you just mentioned. I think that's what we need in America. And that's what again Ignatius like is offering us right here. There is reason today to think that we are on the precipice of change. But you know why, my friend? There is no guarantee if we want to do it by ourselves. We have to come to this moment where we open ourselves to allow Christ renew us again and give us as people who walk through to find this new land, his way of being and way of proceeding, which is nothing else is the spiritual works that we have to engage to. The spiritual works have to be have to begin today. We were on the street, now it's time right now like the like the against the you you put it very beautifully like the ex of these people we're on the street we walk we fight then now it's time to be open to receive the new commitment from god as a way we're supposed to be you know as a way we're supposed to continue the path and there is no but or no other ways that can be is the spiritual ways and we have to be and willing and open to have this conversion that have to happen. And it, the other things, like, it's very, very clear, you know, Ignatius and him, himself, he give us like these tools here where we have to be, take time to examine what is going on. The examine like is very, very, very important. Like he, one of the key elements in Ignatian spirituality, it's from that like, he's very, very clear Unless we examine the moment and we examine what just happened, we examine our new exodus in the United States that bring us right now to this promised land, then be open, detach from where we are and to attach from who God wants us to be in this new land. Yes, Patrick, I hear that evocation, that powerful evocation of Martin Luther King Jr. in the the idea that he is like a Moses, right? He speaks of himself like a Moses who does not make it to the promised land. And we know that that he was assassinated before, as we know, we're still doing the work, right? Where we haven't we haven't arrived yet mm-hmm. uh, in the prov- promised land. The work is not finished. This is why it's very, very important for the examine here, David, because 
the messiness, the messiness that we are in today is deeper than we thought because the messiness is in us. We have to come to this sense of like self-examinations. That's what in fact Martin Luther King was very, very clear, was talking to the people in the beloved community. When you talk about like, you know, he was very, very clear when he said like, our goal is to create a beloved community and we require qualitative change in our soul, as well as a quantitative change in our life. This is why it's become important like to have the self-examination. When like in May 4th, 1966, when Martin Luther King said that and challenged us to you know, analyze ourselves for this change, we have to come to the self-examination. It's because, you know, we have been working so far. We've been fighting, we've been doing everything. But remember, we have to come for this deep self of conversions because, again, these things like is deeper, this deeper than we thought. You might be whatever, whoever you want, but unless, you know, we come here to this point of like self-examinations and see God as a point of the, the point of directions, the vector of direction for these liberations, we are not going to be able to get there. And, the, and again, I'm, I'm going to get by James Baldwin against, you know, he's the man that I really love so much. And I think James Baldwin and Ignatius, they are really, really like today, they are talking to American people. When like in 1964, he wrote on this, like the white problem for against when is I like beautifully put it like you say where the founder of this country <laughs> had it has a fatal flaw. They said that they were like Christians. They said they were founding a nations on the principles. But guess what? They had chattels. They they had us. They had my parents that I tell you and. You know why? Still today, we are still denying that the founder of the country never, never wanted to acknowledge my parents as human. Because, you know, if they had acknowledged that my, grand, when my grandfather was a man when he arrived in 1719 in Pensacola, guess what? If they recognize him as a human, they would have to treat him like they were, give him everything. But instead, they said, no, they were, we were not human. Then unless we recognize that, unless we go deep inside of us to analyze that, we are not going to be able to get it, brother. We're not going to be able to get at this place to cross on the promised land. We all today can be dancing on our feet as a kumbaya. We made it. However, we have to come to the realization recognize who we are. This is again part of the spiritual exercises of Ignatian spirituality, which is why it's very, very clear, why he's insisting, you know, before we come to ask God for forgiveness, we have to recognize that we are the sinners. And then that's the line where it's very, very clear. All of the Jesuits and the, and the world, they can say that we are all sinners, but yet loved by God. This is where we have to begin. This is the place. It's not romanticizing, glorifying, or oh, we made it to the promised land. But we had to acknowledge where we come from, how we got here, and what we bring with us. I'm so sorry. I'm become like very passionate. I don't know, very passionate about this, but I'm so sorry. Oh, thank you, Patrick. It, I hear that passion in your voice. And I think of these examples, these towering examples of James Baldwin and Martin Luther King Jr. I had read at the beginning of the summer, James Baldwin's book, uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And then reflecting too on your language now with uh, the I have been to the mountaintop uh, speech. And you see the power of this image of the mountaintop for the African-American community in the United States. And what, what I, I have the image in my head of Moses who is standing you know, at the top of, of Mount Sinai. And I don't know whether this is true or not, but I'm just in my head, the vision that I have is that from that mountaintop, he can look back and see you know, the Red Sea and he can see off in the distance Egypt, 
he sees that past and it, and it, and acknowledges it and and feels that pain of the past and at the same time is is looking forward into the promised land across the jordan where humanity is destined to go and you see this if i mean i don't <laughs> the image is probably not very historically or geographically accurate but maybe in a spiritual sense that's a little bit of of the spiritual work that we have to do which is repentance conversion as you put it uh, in ignatian language that beginning of the spiritual exercises where before we can move on to accompany jesus on his work of building the kingdom of god we first must look within and look not only at our own sin but look at the sin of the world and then regarding liberation theology, of course, there's that lens towards oppression and there's the lens towards an, an analysis of the nature of oppression. But there also is that great word <laughs> that is the topic of this episode, which is utopia, which is this view that, that Moses, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. have of this beloved community. But it doesn't. It's it's not realized yet. We're not there yet. But we we must have that vision of that possibility in order to animate us. And that's where hope comes in, right? The, a hope that becomes alive. The hope that moves us to, as you say, to go forth and carry out the work of turning hope into reality, turning hope into love. That's very, very beautifully said, David. Thank you very, very much. But you know, I mean, I think I would, I would even go further here to try to challenge your your audience. Like, who am I for them? When they think about like a friends, a black friends, a brown, yellow, black, a people of color, and the friends in the neighborhood, who they, who do they see? That's a whole like utopia that you're talking about in this episode. It is so important right now because all of us, we have become on a moment that's so driven by our own individual brains. You're, you're, on, you're, you're on, a, on your own social media platform, your micro reality that show you yourself. It is very difficult for us to move from outside of our own selves into a broader understanding of a relations, a genuine relationships with others, you know? It's so difficult today to see your brother as a human, as one. As I said earlier, the founder of this nation never see my, grand, my parents, my grand grandparents as human. And today we are just like almost in the same ways. Don't think, to a certain point, at a certain degree, like slavery has been abolished in America. No, it's not. Slavery just evolved because as long as you don't recognize me fully as a human, rather you cannot see me fully as a person, as a human being, you still see me as some other. This is a problem we are having here. This complex reality of the utopia, of a way of seeing this person, but always as an, an other. What do we want to make of this? Ignatius never see it that way. Ignatius came in and challenged us. Number one, pay attention. You see, my whole work in this book, in fact, is about healing. You cannot heal from what you don't know. Today, as we are talking today, you have it a divided country that divided left and right, red and blue, yellow and brown, because no one wants to know the other person. Again, with this sense of lack of fear, as Ignatius was put it, but also no one is it this sense of fear of recognizing if this person is a human being. If I am a human being just like you, you will not really even like think of putting your neck on my your foot, your knee on my neck for so long. You will never think that, oh, if I come to your house, if I come on your neighborhood, you're not, I'm, I'm gonna do harm to your children. I'm gonna decrease the value of your property. 
You will never, if you see me as a human being, you will never think once you see me walking, you're not gonna call police 911 on me. This is here that we are talking about the sense of like knowing. What do we choose to know in this country as Christians, as Catholic? Who do we choose to know as people? This is what we are talking, what we are talking here. My, my, unless we come here, my work is about knowing, healing, conversion, and transformation. In order to heal, you have to know. You will never be able to heal from what you don't know. Then we have to engage in this history. It might be dirty. It might be looks very, very not the way we want it though, but let's look at it. Then we have to convert, allow the Holy Spirit to convert us. Ignatius, like when he was like in Pamplona, when he received this bullet from the French, then that completely changed his like trajectory, the rest of his life forever to the point that he has given the church one of the greatest gifts that the church has ever received is the spiritual exercises. Was simply of the simple fact he take time to sit down for in this conversion process, which today is transforming us. It is important before everything we are talking about, we come to the sense of like knowledge. We have to know. Today you are we are somehow navigate, navigating on a society that is like anti-knowledge. We have a sense of allergic with knowledge. Nobody wants to know. In fact, we, ha we have even forgotten if knowledge is one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Nobody wants to know. We, it's very, very clear. We have this sense of like superficiality where everybody will try to put themselves very, very comfortably. And somehow one can even say that America today, just like it never, never land. People just feel more comfortable when they play by innocence. But we have to, we are trying to comfort, comfort ourselves. We are trying to adjust to injustice. As long as it's not bother me, I don't care. How, how can you live, we live like that? With this selective knowing from what is not bother us so that it's not belongs to us. But anyway, I don't know. I'm sorry, David. I hear you speaking of this fear, this almost willful ignorance. Where, where does that come from? What, what is the end game? How do you interpret that, that fear, that ignorance? Is it people are afraid of the demands that would be made on them to change if they were to have intimacy with people who are different from them? Is it that people are afraid of, you know, now that I know this, I have this knowledge, how will I respond to it? Or do you have another analysis? How do you interpret that fear and that, that kind of willful ignorance that you've identified? This is what I call in my work, the spiritual value gap. The spiritual value gap today that has been built in America. It is context that, you know why? I, I feel more comfortable spiritually where I am because if I choose to know that is not gonna be a lie and that's gonna bother, that is not gonna be a truth, sorry, and that's gonna bother me. That I, I don't want to know this part. And what I knew, it's better than that. In fact, whatever I have and I knew when I know it, that was way better than what I supposed to know now. This is where we have to challenge. We selectively choose what we want to know so that it doesn't bother us and our comfort. This is where, again, I say that to you, it's just like we are, we are trying to adjust to injustice. We travel, we move around in the surface because we are afraid to see what is on the dark cellar. We don't want to look at the racist act of the face. We don't want to embrace and to examine ourselves. Again, this like place become like a never, never land. We all never, never land. We all want to be lost boy and girls, but we don't want to be responsible and accountable. 
we rather be we would rather be safe and secure in our innocence. This is where we have this deep sense of attachment. This is where Ignatian spirituality is coming so handy and important because that's why Ignatian spirituality is challenge us. You cannot be innocent in the face of death. You cannot be innocent in the face of like someone putting your knee in the neck of another human being. You cannot be innocent of a mother who is being dying on the floor of a hospital without having oxygen just because of the skin of color. You cannot be innocent of so many people on the street who cannot rent a house or buy a property where they're supposed to have it just because of the skin of color. You cannot be innocent on the, on the face of this. We have to go past this spiritual lie that we have been told, this spiritual value gap that has been established upon which is only what I choose to know spiritually that's supposed to be the reality. We have to understand our innocence sometimes, any attachments to an innocence can be seen as a way that taking us away from God. You cannot be innocent in the face of injustice. No, there can be no justice. There can be no love in the face of abuse. Injustice has to be called by its name. The selective ways that we have to cho we choose to know also is a way that's taking us away from God. This is where it's come very, very handy. The spiritual works of racial justice. We have to pray. We have to ask God for the grace to engage and bring here and see ourselves and get away as we try to put this, our attention on the ways that we are like, we want to deform the attention so that we can attach to the injustice. Your powerful words, Patrick, are taking me back to Luke chapter four, where Jesus in this kind of epic moment, right? He gets up to read the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. And one of the things that he says he is going to do that was prophesied in the, in the Old Testament was precisely to, to give sight to the blind. And what I'm thinking about here related to that is folk, some folks today, and even though it has just over and over again been dismantled, a lot of people are saying, you know, I am color blind. And, and we see, I see in the operation of that language, I am colorblind, this a blindness. And the blindness is this blindness that you're speaking of. You're talking about people don't want to see. They don't want to see what is happening. They don't want to see that image. And, and what I'm saying, people don't want to see. I'm saying white people don't want to see. And rich people don't want to see. And especially right, white rich people don't want to see. All of these moving and heart-wrenching scenes that you are describing but it is Jesus who, who comes and says, woe to the rich and blessed are the poor. And it is Jesus who comes and says to the outsider, I've seen more faith in you than I've seen in Israel. <laughs> it, it, Jesus is breaking down these barriers, but he's, he's telling it like it is. He's opening up people's eyes to the reality of sin for the sake of conversion. That's, wh that's what I'm hearing. Yep, yep. This, is, this is well said and perfectly said here. Um, I think Christ is still waiting for us and is not going to go anywhere without us. We have to be open and willing to come as we are and acknowledge that we have a wound that has been festered in our brothers and sisters in this land for more than 400 years and the making it is so important and necessary to present a way 
to show a spiritual x-ray from our heart where we can finally understand and be willing to see and engage in this place of conversions. It's never too late. In fact, this is where it's like Christ, that's why it's very interesting with this guy because never too late. We have mercy, we have redemptions. We all have a place to be, but we have to remember there can be no love without justice. On our next episode, we will continue with Ignacio Eucaria's Utopia and Prophecy, but for now, let us end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Creator, you have given all peoples one common origin. It is your will that they be gathered together as one family in yourself. Fill the hearts of humankind with the fire of your love and with the desire to ensure justice for all. By sharing the good things you give us, may we secure an equality for all, all of our sisters and brothers throughout the world. May there be an end to division, strife, and war, and may there be a dawning of a truly human society built on love and peace. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our companion and our liberator. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.